Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Hi, Mark. Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Do, do you hear me? Mandy, can you hear me? Mark, are you there? Uh, am I muted? No, Mark, I can hear you. Wait. Can you hear me? Andy, can you hear me? Huh. Hey, Allison, can you hear me? I'm 
Hi, Mark, Allison, can you hear me? Uh, Hello, Mandy, Mark, can, you, can Allison, you hear me? Can you hear me? Mandy? Hello, Mandy? Hello? Mandy, can you hear me? Hi, Mark, can you say hello if you can hear me? Mandy, I'm here, can you hear me? Hello? Mandy? All right, Hi, Mark. I cannot hear you, Mark. Um, stand by, I'm gonna get uh, some tech help. Mark, I'm a participant. My name is Pearl. I can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, Mandy can't seem to hear me for some reason. No, she can't. And I can hear Mandy too. I'm connected via Wi-Fi. So I don't know if maybe, maybe her external. Okay. Um, I think I'll just stay on here for, and see what happens. Okay. But I can hear both of you. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, good. I see you. Okay, hi. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame it, this is the last Zoom can meeting. You see, can you see me too? Am I, <laughs> I'm, am I showing up? Yes, you are. Okay, good. Actually, Jen, let me see if she can do that. She's probably already logged in this time of hour. How do we get our copies? I don't, I'm, Cammie's probably going to give us to me for landscape show on August 27th. Okay. I'm giving a talk there. You are. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Mark. Can you do a testing one, two, three again? Yes, Mandy. Can you hear me? This is Mark. Loud and clear. We can hear you. Yay. Oh, great. Okay. Very good. All right. So we're just, uh, we still have about seven minutes till the meeting starts. And then uh, I'm going to say a few announcements, introduce okay. you, and then I'm going to make you a co-host. Okay, great. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone in person and on Zoom, we have a lot of announcements tonight, so we're going to get started right at seven in just about five minutes. And for everyone here in person, there's a book giveaway in the back. 
we need to get rid of all those books. So please take one or take them off. And we are doing our plant drawing today. Our tickets are one ticket for $1 or six tickets for $5. Okay. Sure. All right, Mark, I'm going to see if I can make you a co-host just to double check. Okay. I think it worked. Um, I think it's working. Yeah, it seems to be working. Good. All right, just a few more minutes and then we'll get started. We have quite a selection of plants here in person for drawing. So Julie has some tickets up there for sale if anyone's interested. And Mark, just so you know, we have 19 or 20 people here in person, too. Wow. As well as that's, our 11 participants on Zoom. That's fabulous. Yeah, I 
Okay. Okay. And I'll see All right, hi everybody here in person and on Zoom. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Mandy Morgan. I'm the president of the Tarflower chapter and we're happy to have everybody here. We have a lot of announcements tonight that I'm gonna try to get through a little quickly because uh, Mark Minow, our guest speaker, who's joining us virtually on Zoom, we can see his face right here, uh, so he can get started on his talk on loss. <laughs> All right, so this weekend, um, August 7th and August 8th is going to be our largest uh, installation at the Mead Gardens Sand Hill and the Gopher Tortoise Habitat. Yet, we're going to be planting around 1,500 native grasses to connect our two existing sand hill areas. So, if you look at this map, and if you're not familiar with the Sand Hill Restoration Project, <laughs> at Mead Gardens. We have this area over here that has already been installed uh, 2014 and 2017. And then we have this area over here, which was installed in 2013. And here is our large area that we're gonna be working on in three phases to connect it, really excited. And over here is phase one. So we'll be planting 1500 grasses. Some of the grasses that we're planting are actually plants that we got that we rescued last Thursday from a development site. So that's also very exciting. So we hope that we can get as many people as possible to join us. There's about 50 volunteer slots per day. And I think so far we only have maybe 10 or 15 people signed up per day. So if anyone's available Saturday or Sunday to come out the first half of the morning, that would be greatly appreciated. And you can sign up on our uh, website calendar link with signup.org or signup.com. Secondly, on August 14th, we're having a field trip to B.B. Brown's Gardens in Claremont. And that's actually gonna be led by Mark Minow, our speaker tonight. So that's very exciting. Uh, Pete will also be there, our wonderful field trip leader. And on September 7th will be our, uh, our monthly meeting with Karina Vudry, that's gonna be a, a starting your native plant journey. So it's gonna be a really good meeting to invite a friend or someone that may be not as familiar with native plants, but is interested. Um, also a hybrid meeting. And then on October 5th is going to be our large October Native Plant Month celebration meeting here. We're gonna try, try to get started around 6.30 instead of seven. 
and that's going to be led by Dr. Craig Hugel, um, Florida's Abundant Asters, and we're also going to be joined by other Central Florida chapters like Lake Beauty Berry. Hopefully some other chapters are going to join in. Um, I also invited people from Audubon Society and Sierra Club, so that should be a really fun and big meeting. We're also going to have a hybrid option for that, so there will be a Zoom link for those who can't make it in person. And following that October 5th meeting, we're actually doing our second ever camping trip. And the camping trip is gonna to be to Lake Kissimmee State Park. It's gonna be that Friday night following the Tuesday meeting. And uh, $15 for members, $20 for non-members. You can register by emailing us. Uh, space is limited. We got a, camp, a group campsite that only fits about 25 people. And on Saturday morning, we're gonna have a field trip to Kissimmee Prairie Preserve State Park, which is about 30 miles outside of the Lake Kissimmee State Park. And that's gonna be led by Dr. Craig Hubel. So we're really excited about that. And that night at the campgrounds, we're also having a um, starry sky consultant named Madeline May give us a night sky talk with some telescopes. And we'll be doing a camping style dinner. So we hope that some of you will join us on our second camping trip ever. And our last announcement for the evening is that this December and this uh, upcoming January, our meetings are actually going to move from Lou Gardens over to the Mead Gardens Azalea Lodge. Um, Lou Gardens has a special event going on those months, so we were lucky to be able to book the Azalea Lodge. It was just uh, all redone. And it's really nice inside, and we're actually really excited about these two meetings being held there. So I'm starting the announcement soon so that everyone can get the memo. But it should hopefully be a really easy transition for those two months, and we're very excited about it. All righty. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and we're going to get Mark's uh, PowerPoint presentation up on the screen. So Mark, you should be able to share your screen now. And while he's figuring that out, I'm gonna just give you a little intro about uh, Dr. Mark Minow. Uh, he has a PhD in zoology and 30 plus years of professional experience as a scientist. He's currently a water resource coordinator with the Suwannee River Water Management District in Live Oak, Florida. And in addition to his many years of experience with wetlands, Dr. Minow is keenly interested in conservation biology and has conducted field research throughout the US and in Central America, South America, Caribbean, Europe, and India. Since 2011, Dr. Minow has been working with biologists in Cuba to better understand the ecological relationships of imperiled butterflies in Southern Florida. He has authored and co-authored six books and six book chapters on butterflies and plants. So please welcome Dr. Mark Minow. Thank you so much, Mandy. Can everybody hear me okay? We can hear you loud and clear. Can you see the screen okay? Yep, the screen looks good. Fantastic. Okay, I wish I could be there. Lou Gardens is such a beautiful garden, um, but we're doing it Zoom. Uh, so um, everybody seems to be doing Zoom stuff these days. Uh, so moths, of uh, it's a huge subject. I'm going to just kind of briefly touch on a lot of different things here as we go along and you can ask questions as we go through here. Don't uh, just, just chime in or raise your hand or whatever. Um, but we're gonna start with classification because um, you know plants have names just like people have names. That all started in the 1700s um, with Carl Linnaeus. Um, here you see some pictures of him as a young man on the left here holding his namesake Linnaea borealis. And you may notice the little picture down here, a picture of Linnaea borealis. My granddaughter and I were just in Northern New Mexico, hiking in the mountains with the Boy Scouts. And what a surprise to see Linnaea borealis there in the mountains of New Mexico uh, when it was first described by Linnaeus uh, from Lapland in Northern Europe. How did it get there? <laughs> um, so uh, our classification system then starts with uh, uh, Carl Linnaeus 
Uh, his goal was to catalog all the plants and animals that they knew about at that time. Uh, and he succeeded in naming uh, of over 4,000 different kinds of uh, animals and over 7,000, almost 8,000 different species of plants. So uh, our modern classification system starts with his 10th edition of his catalog, which he called Systema Naturae, and that's in 1758. Any other names that precede that are not recognized today. So uh, this, this catalog with his names is the beginning of our classification system. And he used this hierarchical system uh, based on different uh, ranks from kingdom, the most uh, inclusive phylum class order family, and finally down to species. And he, he figured, uh, you know, people have two names. Uh, so uh, plants and animals could have two names. And so uh, he started this binomial system of classification and naming things. Now, he, his, he only had three kingdoms at the time. And does this sound familiar? Uh, animal, vegetable, and mineral? That's a game people play today. That was uh, from Linnaeus's three kingdoms at the time. Currently, we have seven kingdoms of, of different kinds of critters, uh, bacteria, uh, different kinds of uh, animals, plants, uh, fungi uh, are, are part of the seven kingdoms that we recognize today. So um, today, uh, people like common names. Um, you know, in Linnaeus's day, they didn't use common names, uh, but uh, today, um, uh, almost everything seems to have a common name and people are actively trying to give common names to things that don't have them. So most plants, uh, butterflies, uh, all seem to have common names and those are trying to be standardized uh, according to different uh, people, authorities. Uh, and so they may have a common name. So if we look at a butterfly like this uh, tiger swallowtail, this is the Eastern tiger swallowtail we have here in Florida and the Eastern United States. Well, uh, Linnaeus named this butterfly back in 1758. It was one of the ones in his catalog, and he called it Papilio Glaucus. And the L stands for his name, period, the author, and the date. So sometimes we leave that information off. Uh, other times we put it on there. Uh, but, you know, names change. Uh, scientific names can change because people are constantly working on this and discovering new relationships. And so, uh, from, from Linnaeus's uh, genus name, Papilio, uh, it's been often in modern times put into the genus Terroris. Uh, so you'll see Terroris Glaucus. And these parentheses around his name and the date indicate that it's been changed from what he originally described it in as Papilio. Now, sometimes you may see three names. Uh, and this, these are for species that... Um, are, are uh, widespread perhaps, or uh, occur in different populations that uh, look a little bit different. Uh, we call those races or subspecies. And so, um, so there's uh, a couple of different subspecies of the tiger swallowtail. Uh, and, and so that gets a third name, Papilioglaucus glaucus is the typical one uh, that Linnaeus had seen. But here's another one, Maynard I, was the, uh, the one uh, found in Florida. Uh, and, um, and, and, and you can go crazy with these names because, um, you know, when they were first describing things, somebody, somebody said, oh, well, here's a new butterfly. I'm going to call it, you know, um, a, a different name. And, and some, some species have, have just hundreds of different names maybe assigned to them if they're really variable and widespread. Uh, but we only recognize the first name uh, and so as, as the, the true scientific name. So that would go back, in this case, to Linnaeus's name, Papilio Glaucus. Now, um, it's, um, uh, we, we use comparative morphology. Morphology is how plants and animals look. You know, what do they look like? How, and, and how do they compare? How does this species compare to another species? So for things like uh, uh, butterflies and moths, we would uh, use all different kinds of things, the uh, wing venation, the, the shapes and sizes of the antennae, the legs, other structures. 
but really mostly, uh, you know, we've been using color patterns since butterflies and moths have distinctive color patterns uh, uh, to, to de describe and, and differentiate different species. Those have been used a lot, but the gold standard in insects uh, for telling one species from the next are the genitalia and um, usually the male genitalia. The males uh, usually have uh, clasping uh, organs uh, and you see those on, on, on the right here, these clasping organs that they use to grab onto the female. And those uh, seem to vary. Uh, and uh, even though two, two species may look almost identical in color pattern, the genitalia will be different. And so uh, if, you're, if you really want to uh, learn the identity of something, uh, often you have to look at the male genitalia. The female genitalia here on the left can vary also. So if you see this plate here on this side and this one, uh, but they're, they're um, usually not as useful as the male genitalia in differentiating species. So scientists are dissecting out the genitalia and, and looking at these and describing those structures. Now, there's a problem in, in comparative morphology in that um, there, there's variation. And so when you find a butterfly in your yard um, and compare it to a field guide, well, maybe it doesn't look exactly like the field guide. And then you wonder, is this that species or is this something different? And it could be, um, you know, uh, there, there are sexual differences where the males may look different from the females. Uh, and there's regional differences in color patterns that can change. Uh, there's individual patterns where some, some individuals may just have a strikingly different pattern. Uh, there's hybridization going on. So there are all these different forces uh, at work and making uh, it, it sometimes difficult to match up what you have in your hand versus or, or from a photograph versus what your field guides or identification guides are showing. Here's an extreme example of that from this African swallowtail, Papilio dardanus. And uh, up here in the upper uh, left corner, you'll see a typical male and the typical female. Uh, this is a large butterfly, widely distributed in Africa. But uh, in some regions, the some of the females have come to resemble uh, uh, other butterflies. And so you'll have the typical female, but these on, on the right, these are all females of Papilio dardanus that mimic uh, a model species that is distasteful to birds. So this one is mimicking this uh, uh, Danaeus chrysippus. Uh, this middle one is this uh, other butterfly here. These are models are all distasteful. The birds won't touch them. And over um, years uh, of evolution, uh, th this butterfly has developed this knack for uh, for only the females uh, resembling these butterflies, and they gain protection by looking like this distasteful model. It's amazing the variation here. Well, it, it, since, since um, Linnaeus's time in the 1700s, 1800s, you know, it was uh, comparative morphology. You were just classifying, you're trying to find different species and, and describe them and name them. Uh, and, and uh, group them into groups. But it wasn't until Darwin's uh, publication uh, in, in 1859 on the origin of species that all of that changed uh, because his theory was that, um, that uh, different plants and animals uh, could be similar through ancestry. They were all related uh, and, and developed through time uh, into the array of species that we see in modern times. He had fossils to work from, and he, he did breeding of animals to uh, understand how, how things change from generation to generation. And so then it wasn't just classifying things like pen, here's a pencil and here's another pencil. Uh, it, was, um, it was classifying by ancestry. And so here's a copy of his book on the left. And, um, and so here's an example with buckeyes. Um, you know, we used to think if you look at the older field guides, there were just a couple of species of, of buckeyes in North America. 
And uh, in more recent times with people taking a close look and doing uh, comparisons of DNA, there's, there's all kinds of Buckeyes out there. And, and, and the, the, some of them are <clears throat> extremely closely similar. Uh, others are pretty different from each other. And, uh, and so um, it, it, it's uh, it, it, now we're, we're trying to understand the, 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 the um, ancestry of, of different groups. Well, <clears throat> we have fossils of moths. There aren't, aren't many of these out there and we have fossils of butterflies, but just a few. Here's a really old one from China, 150 million or 125 million years old. Uh, and you can see it's a moth, but you can't really tell much about it. Here's a more modern one on the right where you can see some of the color patterns that were left in the moth and this, these lake shales. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and these seem to be extinct species. They're, 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 they don't seem to match anything we have today. Um, and so there's some fossil record out there, but it's not very good. Um, in classifications, you may see these different diagrams. These are ways of representing relationships then. Uh, the uh, uh, phy phylograms or phenograms or cladograms, uh, there are these boxes that link, um, you know, related groups like uh, the Chirac signs and the Cetirines here, you see are, are more closely related than they are to these other groups. And the branching pattern shows how we think that they diverged over time and, and, and created other, other, um, uh, other groups from uh, ancestors. And so uh, you, you'll see these uh, a lot these days. Now, just to show in butterflies here, some, and it's the same in moths, uh, some of the problems with uh, trying to uh, just look at morphology, color patterns. For instance, these upper four here on the left, these are all the same species of butterfly, but uh, these are different subspecies from different parts of their range. And look at the variation in here. Uh, how would you even tr attempt to match these? Uh, or or uh, sa same thing with these, these guys down below here, um, uh, that uh, these two different species of, of um, passion flower butterfly are well known uh, to, um, uh, to, to resemble each other. And on, on the right here, I, and I've taken all these examples from the internet, you can go on and find these. Uh, all, these are all different species on the right, including a moth, a day flying moth that resembles all of these different species. Tremendous um, similarity. Um, so now we have a new technique though, relatively new, the um, genetic or genomics uh, testing, where they're looking at a section of DNA. This is the cytochrome oxidase one, uh, was the first one, uh, section to be used. Uh, and uh, so they, the scientists started, uh, you know, decoding the DNA uh, in this seg segment uh, and, uh, and compared it across all kinds of different animals and plants uh, to, uh, to see how that section differs from, from species to species. And they, they're doing this now with the COVID virus. This is the PCR reaction, right? Where you, uh, you take that section, you amplify it and, uh, and match up the strands uh, and uh, see how, the, how they uh, differ from species to species. So if you're just looking at uh, one or two genes here, you're, that's called genetics. Uh, if you're looking at whole whole sections, whole, whole suites of, of genes. It, now they're calling it genomics, uh, this comparison. So this has been a really powerful thing um, because we're getting away then from just color patterns and, and all the problems with uh, trying to match color patterns and figure out, uh, is this due to ancestry or is this due to convergence of different, different species? Um, and so it, it, again, a very powerful tool. Back in uh, 2004, this paper was published on this widely distributed, uh, beautiful skipper butterfly, Astraptes fulgurator, and, um, and they, they did the DNA comparison, and they found out it wasn't one species that looked like that. There were 10 species in here, 
that were masquerading under the, this one name. Uh, and once you know that, uh, you go, oh, well, you know what? Uh, all the caterpillars look different also, and, and, and they feed on different plants. And so we, we had this information all along, but uh, people would just go, well, you know, you raise this caterpillar and it turns into this adult, and this one down here turns into this adult. They must all be the same thing. It's just variation in the caterpillars. But no, it, it, they, they turn, they are actually different species. And now we know that we can assign them to these different species. So the molecular research has been incredibly powerful, incredibly important for de determining uh, relationships of different organisms. Here's a plant example. You're all probably familiar with sugarberry, Celtis levigata. And uh, at one time it was put into its own family, the Celtidaceae. Uh, and then, you know, people notice, well, the, the leaves look a lot like elm leaves. And so you'll see it in older books where it's been placed into the elm family, the Alm, Almaceae. And where do they put it now with the molecular? And it's in the marijuana family. Who would have ever guessed that, that this tree in your backyard is in the marijuana family? Uh, but that's what the molecular data are telling us, and it's probably right. What the hell? Um, th this is impossible to read, but just I just want you to show the diversity uh, of moths. That, so this study by uh, Akito Karahawa, Kawahara. Uh, Akito is a researcher here at the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. He's been there for quite a while now doing nothing but molecular look uh, and um, at, at different groups of, um, of uh, moths, especially. And so what this shows is um, way back, uh, the, the most primitive living moths that we have today are tiny little moths and they don't have sucking mouth parts, they have chewing mouth parts. Uh, and, uh, and those seem to have emerged uh, 300 million years ago. And from there, uh, it's just been, uh, you know, diversifying and, and uh, especially with the, the end of the dinosaur age, when our modern world evolved with uh, modern species of flowering plants and mammals and birds, uh, butterflies, all this stuff just uh, exploded. Uh, into all these different kinds of groups. Uh, you'll notice the butterflies here, uh, they, they uh, can fall out in the middle of the moths. They're really just a group of specialized, highly specialized day flying moths are the butterflies. Uh, and then all the other different groups emerge very quickly, uh, it, it, you know, about a hundred million years ago. Uh, just to put the butterflies and moths in, in perspective, um, you know, when I was a student in college, uh, anything with six legs was called an insect. Uh, well, now that's not true. These other uh, more primitive groups like the, uh, uh, the, the springtails and these other soil dwelling things and um, uh, uh, silverfish, those kinds of things are are not considered insects. So we're calling these things with six legs now hexapods. And, um, and so the, um, the branch with the, the, the butterflies and moths are over here next to the trichoptera, which are the caddisflies, uh, and uh, related to uh, beetles and uh, uh, bees and, and wasps and, and flies. This is the higher groups of insects that are uh, all related. So the order Lepidoptera, which are the moths and butterflies, these are the scale-winged insects. When you look at a magnified section of their, uh, of their wing, you'll see the flattened hairs, which we call scales, that are attached by a little peg into a, a socket in the wing. And the scales, uh, each scale is of a particular color. Here's white and blue, black scales mixed together. And when you have patches of scales of similar colors, these, these make the color patterns on the moths and butterflies, as you see here on the swallowtail wing. 
Caddis flies are different. Their, their adults look kind of similar to moths. They have very long antennae. They have uh, biting mouth parts, which are quite different from, from, uh, from, from butterflies and moths, but their, their color patterns are similar. But their wings are covered with hairs rather than scales, as you see here. And their larvae are aquatic uh, with gills. And they live in ponds and rivers and streams. So um, even though they're their closest really living relatives of butterflies and moths, uh, they're really quite different. How do you tell a butterfly from a moth? The easiest way is to look at the antenna and the antennae of butterflies are clubbed at the tip or thickened as you see here, or in the case of skipper butterflies, it's not only thickened, but it has a little special extension coming off. The antennae of, butter, of, of moths, rather, um, sometimes they're sort of club, but not really like the butterfly types, or they're just a straight shaft filament coming out, or they're feathery uh, looking. And we'll see some examples of that. Now, how do you find out about moths? The classic book was written by William Holland, who was the curator of the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. Uh, back in the 1800s and early 1900s. He was friends with Andrew Carnegie. He was very religious. He was a, a reverend. Uh, and he sent um, uh, uh, with uh, missionaries, especially missionaries to Africa, he would give collecting uh, materials, nets, and other kinds of things to collect specimens. And as a result, the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh has one of the best African collections anywhere. Uh, from from, uh, from um, Holland's work there. And he got this idea, uh, he published uh, earlier uh, the what's called the Butterfly Book, uh, fantastic, uh, amazing book published in the late 1800s, all kinds of color plates of, of butterflies from all over the United States. And then he published the sequel book, the, um, the Moth Book, uh, and a similar format, beautiful color plates of moths uh, from all over the United States. He had the idea, um, he was going to publish these books and he, he put a copy in every school library at the time to help young people understand the natural world. This was a time when there was a craze of, you know, people uh, were still living on farms mostly uh, and uh, young people were uh, observing moths, birds. Uh, they were collecting things. Uh, they were uh, collecting bird eggs, huge numbers of people collecting bird eggs and, and birds uh, and butterflies and making their own collections. And so he did this identification guide to help with that. This was reprinted in 1968 by Dover Publications. You can still find these online for, for sale. Uh, and the classification system is out of date, but they're still incredible books. When I was a kid, I found this, the Butterflies and Moths uh, Golden Guide. It cost me $1.50. It was an amazing, and it still is an amazing book because it shows many common kinds of butterflies and moths, not only what the adults look like and the sizes, but also the caterpillars and the plants that they eat. Uh, you know, you, you just couldn't find this. It had maps showing the, the range maps and gave a little information about the description of, of them. Uh, phenomenal book. It's still in print today and updated and revised. Uh, if, if you don't have any books on butterflies and moths, I would highly recommend that. Here in Florida, uh, we had Charles Kimball uh, publish this checklist of the Lepidoptera of Florida. Every butterfly and moth that was known at that time in 1965 is in this book. It has uh, color plates as well as black and white plates, uh, as well as the scientific names and where they were found in Florida. Charles did his own collecting. Uh, he also visited all kinds of museums and got information from them. Uh, and there's over 3,000 different kinds of moths listed in this book for Florida. I bought my copy from the Department of Agriculture for $5. I think they may still have it available. Uh, it, and it's been updated also by John Hepner and other authors in 2003. It's a classic resource uh, that you can't do without if you're going to work on moths. Uh, in 1984, Charles Covell, who was a professor at the University of Louisville, uh, 
he, he's, he's been involved with the Lepidoptera Society for years. He published the field guide to uh, Eastern moths, uh, one of the Peterson guides. This has gone through many different editions, many different covers on it, but the information is basically the same inside. And you, you, it's an essential book if you're gonna work on moths. Uh, there's also some other Peterson guides now, this one to the Southeastern uh, states, and there's one for the Northeastern states also. Beautiful plates in here showing uh, exactly what to look at to differentiate different species of common moths. There's some professional societies out there you may consider joining or, or linking up with. They have meetings and uh, interesting newsletters and, and journals, the Lepidoptera Society and the Southern Lepidoptera Society uh, are available. Then there's all kinds of web sources now that were never available when I was a kid. I, I often think back how did I ever know anything about butterflies and moths? I didn't know anybody that knew anything about butterflies and moths. It was only through those books that I'm showing you that I learned about butterflies and moths. But nowadays we have all kinds of other resources. iNaturalist, Bug Guide, Butterflies and Moths of North America or Bomona, they call it, um, the Moth Photographers Group. Uh, you can send, you can take a picture of a moth, you don't know what it is, to send it to any one of these sources and they'll identify it for you and tell you what it is. Um, I noticed the other day on the Moth Photographers Group, there's even a, a separate uh, uh, link to moths of Lake County, Florida. It's perfect for you guys in Central Florida uh, to see some of the beautiful photos that they've taken. Uh, with digital cameras and, uh, and, and these webs, uh, 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 platforms to work on. Uh, it's become so much easier to learn about moths and butterflies. Uh, the plants, uh, also Atlas of Florida Plants, you got to use this. I use this all the time. It's an incredible site, one of the best uh, plant guides uh, in, in, in the United States or the world, for that matter, uh, on the Atlas of Florida Plants. Everybody okay? Still there? We're here. Okay, let's look at some moths, starting with your house. Okay, what kinds of moths are living in your house? Well, you may have clothes moths, like this case bearer clothes moth that makes a little silk case. Uh, and um, in related to it is this plaster bagworm moth. The clothes moths uh, are nature's uh, cleaners. They, uh, they eat uh, hair and wool, which is course from sheep. So if you have a suit made of wool hanging in your closet, you may be attacked by, by uh, clothes moths. The, that's what they eat. They, uh, the larvae eat wool and hair and uh, they'll uh, totally destroy your woolens or, um, or furs, anything like that, that you, or feathers uh, that you may have in your closet. So if you open the door and you see a tiny little thing fluttering around, that's probably one of these clothes moths. Now, more, more likely on the outside of your house, but I see these inside our house sometimes, the plaster bagworm. If you go look in the wall of your house, uh, you'll see these little cases. And uh, in this case, the plaster bagworm moth is not eating hair, it's eating spider webs, which are made of protein. And so um, these are extremely common. Uh, anywhere there's a structure, you're likely to see the plaster bagworm. If you go to the grocery store and you're walking down the cereal aisle and you see a little moth flying around, it's probably the Indian meal moth, which attacks stored products, uh, stored uh, beans or uh, cereals, uh, popcorn even. Uh, these moths will lay eggs in there and get in there and you may buy a package that has the caterpillars in it and bring it home and then uh, establish a colony in your own kitchen or pantry. Indian meal moth. There are many um, species of moths that uh, people consider pests that are outside in your garden uh, or in the forest. Uh, and you may see these, the fall webworm moth. Have you seen these big messy nests uh, cover, covering whole trees sometimes? Uh, they're getting especially abundant right now. Uh, that's the fall webworm moth. Here's the adult. Uh, or that you may see in the springtime, the tent caterpillars 
uh, which make this very dense silk nest with many caterpillars, beautiful caterpillar inside. They can defoliate plums and cherry trees. Uh, another really common uh, group are the, the tussock moths in Florida, and especially this white mark, marked tussock moth. Um, the, um, the, the, the caterpillars can become extremely abundant and they'll, the, uh, they'll make their uh, cocoons under the eaves of your house or uh, under picnic tables or any kind of structure like that that's dry. They'll, they'll tr make their cocoons. Uh, and as we'll see in a minute, they, um, their larvae have irritating hairs, so you don't want to pick them up. Uh, another interesting thing about these guys is um, the, at least the white mark tussock moth, the, the females are wingless. Here's the female. So when she hatches out of the cocoon, the males have to fly to her and mate with her. Then she lays this giant mass of eggs. And gypsy moths are in this group too. If you've heard of gypsy moths from Europe that are devastating forests in the eastern United States, stripping whole forests of leaves. Um, uh, the, that, the gypsy moth is in the same family, does the same thing, but the females have wings, but they can't fly. So uh, when, they, when the larvae hatch out of here, they have to disperse and they do that like spiders do. They, they uh, secrete a single strand of, of silk and they blow away on the wind uh, to uh, disperse themselves. Uh, another really abundant one is the variable oak leaf caterpillar. I've seen oak forests completely stripped of tree uh, of leaves uh, from this caterpillar. Uh, the caterpillar has a special gland on the underside of its neck, and it can spray this noxious spray, and then uh, so that uh, birds or lizards uh, don't touch these things. When you walk into a forest that's uh, infected with variable oak leaf caterpillar, it sounds like rain from all the droppings of the caterpillars dropping to the ground. Uh, it, it's an amazing phenomenon. Uh, but um, you know, over time, even with these outbreaks, uh, they, they have their own predators uh, that, uh, that can attack them, parasitic flies and wasps. And eventually those things catch up to them and, uh, and, and they settle down again, they're not a pest. Now in your garden, of course, there's many kinds of, of moths that attack your garden plants. One, one of them is this corn earworm moth. So if you buy some corn at the grocery store or you grow your own corn and you open up the ear uh, and you see this worm or, or just some brown goo at the end, that's the corn earworm. But it also feeds on many different plants. It'll attack uh, uh, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, uh, all, all kinds of stuff like that uh, that we want to grow for our own food. Uh, there's even uh, a couple of moths that attack beehives uh, in our major pests. Uh, they, here you see all the caterpillars uh, uh, eating the wax and, uh, and uh, stored pollen and, and uh, materials here in, inside beehives. There's a few uh, moths out, out of the more than 3,000 different kinds that we have just in Florida. There's only a few that have stinging spines on them. Uh, and let's look at some of those. So the Io moth, one of our giant silk moths, gorgeous moth. Uh, you see the spines on the caterpillars. The young ones live in groups like this. The older ones become solitary. When you see spines coming from large, uh, thick uh, uh, structures, you don't want to touch those because those are probably stinging caterpillars. Same with the saddleback caterpillar here. Uh, these spines work kind of like the stinging nettles do, uh, where the spines are hollow and contain a liquid poison. So when you brush against it, the tip of the spine breaks off and releases the poison into your skin. The saddleback caterpillar um, adult uh, is kind of a plain looking thing, not very, not very exciting. Uh, this whole group, this whole family of, of, um, of moths, the slug moths, uh, most of them have sping, stinging spines like this. So if you see a moth with these, again, these, these shaped spines, don't, don't touch it. And just a few of the other ones with hairs uh, to, to avoid uh, is the uh, southern flannel moth here. The larva is called the puss moth. 
Uh, it has these long hairs and they come back into a little tail that I guess somebody thought looked like a kitten. Uh, and so it's called the puss moth, not, not pus, but puss. Uh, and underneath these long hairs are the stinging spines. So you do not want to touch one of these because you'll get stung. Um, it's an amazing moth. Uh, the cocoon that it builds, you know, most moths make a silk cocoon and then pupate inside of that. Uh, and this, this moth is Megalopygi opercularis because it has an operculum. The cocoon has an operculum or a door at one end that when the adult hatches out inside, it pushes open the door and comes out and dries its wings. But you notice also this little hump on top of the cocoon. The caterpillar has plucked the stinging spines and grouped them into this little pouch where this is where birds would want to attack the cocoon. And any bird that tries to peck into the cocoon to eat the pupa gets a mouthful of stinging spines. That's an amazing adaptation. Then we mentioned the tussock moths. Here's the uh, white marked tussock moth uh, caterpillar. And uh, these longer hairs uh, are barbed at, and uh, they break off. So if you pick one of these up, these barbed hairs break off and stick into your skin or, and are very irritating. They don't have any poison associated with them. They're just irritating. Uh, and some people are just allergic to caterpillars and, and a caterpillar with long hairs like this, even if it crawls on their hand, they'll break out immediately. Uh, I, I'm not that way. And most, most people aren't that allergic, but some people are. So uh, you want to be careful uh, in handling a caterpillar. Any questions so far? You guys still there? Okay. Um, here's more pests. Uh, there's the melon moth, squash vine borer that attack uh, squashes, the potato tube, tuber worm attacks your potatoes, and all kinds of different kinds of army worms that the, the caterpillars, um, they hide in the daytime down in the grass or the leaf litter, and then they come out at night and cut your plants or, uh, or eat your plants uh, to pieces. And so these can be really common, really abundant, and just devastate gardens and fields. You may have seen hornworms. If you're growing tomatoes, you probably have seen the Carolina Sphinx or the tobacco hornworm. Now, these often get attacked by uh, burkhanid wasps, and you may see the white wasp cocoons on the outside of the caterpillar, and that caterpillar will die. It won't form an adult. But in the meantime, it's done a lot of damage to your, car, your garden in eating potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplants, that kind of stuff. Or this uh, velvet bean caterpillar. This is a tropical moth that can't survive uh, where it freezes, uh, but it's migratory. So every spring, it starts building up in huge numbers in South Florida and expands. And they go all the way up to Canada uh, it, it, by late summer, uh, they eat anything in the bean family from our native Desmodium, beggar tick kind of plants to, uh, to garden beans, soybeans, uh, and it's a huge pest uh, in, in cultivated fields of beans. Okay, um, so be familiar with those kinds of pest moths, but let's just take a tour of different groups of moths. There are many different kinds, uh, and I'm going to start here with the clothes moth family, uh, and these different kinds. This little black one here is special, uh, found only in Florida, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit in uh, adjacent states. Uh, as, as a clothes moth, it's going to eat hair or something like that, and this particular one eats the outside of dead gopher tortoise shells. Imagine what a specialized niche that is. Uh, somehow this tiny little moth, just a few millimeters across, has to find a dead gopher tortoise shell. It'll lay its eggs and the outside of the shell is uh, made of a material si similar to your fingernails. Uh, and that's what the caterpillars eat. They make a little case uh, and they'll completely eat the outside of that shell. 
amazing. Uh, related to them are the sod webworm moths, which uh, they're very abundant uh, and they're really plain colored. Uh, I'm not sure what they eat. Maybe it's uh, spider silk or something uh, down in the leaf litter, uh, but these acrolophids are, are uh, very common. They're tiny little moths like this grass salarid uh, that are leaf miners as caterpillars. They eat the inside of a leaf. Uh, that's how tiny they are. Um, there's ones that uh, resemble bird droppings. You may be familiar with the bagworm moths. We have maybe 12 or 15 different kinds of these. This is the largest one, Abbott's bagworm. You'll see these cases hanging around on plants and trees, fences. Uh, and so uh, these are made by the caterpillars uh, as a protection. They, they, uh, they're feeding on the leaves of grasses and other kinds of plants. Uh, and they have silk, and so they cut pieces of stem and tie it together into this kind of log cabin kind of house that they live in. Uh, now, the interesting thing about these is um, they, uh, the, the females, uh, they'll pupate inside the case, and they never leave the case. They can't fly. They're just a blob inside this case as an adult. They stick their rear end out of the tip here. Uh, the males can fly though. Here's a male. The males have wings, they fly, and they are able to find the females and mate with them. The females then lay their eggs inside the case. And uh, just like we saw in the tussock moths, the eggs hatch and the larvae balloon away on a strand of silk. They fly away on the wind to disperse themselves. Very odd. Uh, lifestyle. There are different families of these tiny little moths. Um, this one is a pest of cabbages, the diamondback moth. So you may actually see that one in your garden. Uh, these other ones you may see at porch lights or something like that. Um, this is an interesting one, the Aelianthus uh, webworm moth, because um, it's a tropical moth. Uh, but it's now distributed all across the United States and even into southern Canada because it switched over to feeding on Ailanthus, which is a pest tree from China, Chinese tri tr tree of heaven, which uh, is quickly spread from gardens to all over waste places in the United States. And the moth is uh, uh, a webworm that uh, eats the leaves of that. I just recently found this moth attacking corkwood. Uh, which is a rare plant found mostly in, in the Florida panhandle. Uh, so uh, that was an interesting thing. Uh, this family, the Ciseids, are, are all um, wasp mimics as adults. They um, are amazing at looking like wasps. And their larvae are all borers in various kinds of plants. This one is the dogwood borer moth. Um, and here you see some other different kinds of moths. Uh, this carpenter worm, uh, this is a really big moth. Uh, the, the larvae uh, like to bore into willows uh, in swamps and marshes. Uh, so that's probably where you'd most likely see the adult moths. Um, this family, the tortricity, a huge group of moths. Uh, they're leaf rollers as larvae mostly. Uh, but if you see one at a porch light that has this shape, there are no other moth families with a shield shape uh, appearance like that. So if you see that shape, you know immediately it's a tortricid moth. The zygenids here are another mimetic, mimetic group looking like uh, wasps as adults. And this one you'll probably get in your, your I've seen it in my yard, uh, skeletonizing grape leaves. The flannel moth we talked about, the slug moth we talked about. Oh, here's one that's interesting. This one has a caterpillar that's a, it's carnivorous. It feeds on plant hoppers. Uh, it's, it's a tiny little adult, uh, so you may not notice it. Another a tiny group are the, uh, the plume moths. You wonder how this thing can even fly because the, the wings are, are just these narrow bands. Uh, but we have one in Florida that uh, the caterpillar eats sundews, which is a carnivorous plant. Uh, and there's one of these in California, which is a pest of artichokes. They bore into the artichoke heads. Um, and uh, so here's some other groups just to show you the diversity of moths. 
Now, the giant silk moth family here, the Saturnids, uh, you may be familiar or should be familiar with some of these because they come to lights a lot, uh, at porch lights, gas stations, filling up your car, you may see them there. Uh, they're highly attracted to, to lights. Um, now you think these are our largest moths, maybe six inches in wingspan or more for these larger ones, like the Cecropia or the Polyphemus. But um, they don't have mouth parts as adults. Their, their mouth parts are vestigial, they don't feed. And so they have to live off of uh, stored fat uh, as an adult. And they only live for about a week or two as an adult, even though they're, they're big, they just don't live very long. There's another group of this, uh, the, the, the giant silk moths, which don't make silk cocoons. These all burrow into the ground uh, as larvae to make their, their chrysalids or their, their pupae. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful group of moths. Um, uh, the, the buck moth here is interesting. It's, you'll find this in, in very dry oak woods, turkey oak woods. Uh, and the moths emerge in December, when most other things are, uh, are dormant. The hawk moths, another really beautiful uh, group, large, uh, diverse uh, in Florida. And you see some of the diversity here um, uh, in, in beautiful adults. There are some day flying ones, like this Tantalus sphinx that you would see in the Keys or South Florida. But uh, here in, in the rest of Florida, we would have the hummingbird moth. Have you seen this in your garden, perhaps? I get these occasionally in my garden here in Gainesville, the hummingbird moth. Uh, and just some of the other diversity. Our largest moth wingspan wise is the giant sphinx moth. Its caterpillar feeds on pond apples in South Florida. And you may see the tersa sphinx. Uh, this is a very common one. The uh, larvae eat pentas. If you're growing pentas in your garden, you, you may uh, have, have that one around. Tiger moths, another big group. Um, and uh, and, and uh, in, in, in several different subgroups, there's a subgroup that only feeds on lichens on trees or rocks. Uh, and here are some examples of the lichen feeders. Uh, there's some other uh, beautiful ones. This whole group of moths, the tiger moths, are chemically defended like, mon like monarchs. They, they use poisons to defend themselves from, from birds. Birds will never eat these. They may try one and spit it out immediately because they're very bitter tasting. Um, and so you may be familiar with this bella moth. These uh, fly in the daytime uh, as well as at night. And this beautiful pink moth uh, they eat crotalarias as a larva. Or the echo moth, if you're growing uh, kunti plants in your garden, uh, the, the cycad, uh, you, you may get the echo moth coming in and, uh, and eating the leaves of that, which is another highly toxic plant. Uh, and you see some of the diversity, beautiful colors and sizes. These are kind of medium-sized moths. Uh, the leopard moth is very common. You may get that in your yard. In South Florida, we have the day flying faithful beauty moth, uh, which is spectacular. Then there's a whole subgroup of these tiger moths, which mimic wasps. Uh, and you are likely to get these in your garden as well. Uh, like this Dehanna moth, the larva feeds on Spanish moss in oak trees. So you may see the adults kind of fluttering around oak trees in your backyard. This Edwards wasp moth attacks um, uh, fig trees in South Florida. And we have two that feed on oleanders uh, or related plants. This orange one, which is an exotic one that came in in the 1970s in Florida and our native polka dot moth. Um, the scarlet bo bodied wasp moth is just an incredibly beautiful thing. I get this in my garden. Maybe you'll see it in your backyard as well. Inchworm moths, hundreds of species of these, very diverse colors. They tend to look like tree bark, but some of them are, are very colorful. This is a day flying one uh, that uh, uh, you'll see. Uh, it, it feeds on a, a shrub, an exotic shrub called snow on the mountain. If you have that growing in your garden, you're likely to get this moth coming in and attacking it. Um, 
the others feed on all kinds of different things. There's a subgroup that uh, where all the adults are green, shades of green, the um, uh, beautiful, beautiful designs on them, uh, just a spectacular group of moths. Then we have the owlet moths. This is a huge group, hundreds of species in Florida and many different subgroups. I'm just going to show you quickly some, some uh, examples here. Uh, an interesting one is the fruit piercer moth here. Uh, these have a very strong proboscis where they can pierce through uh, fruits as an adult to eat. To eat, There's a relative of this in Africa that uh, actually uh, attacks uh, cattle and other large animals. They, they don't really harm them, but they, they come up and, and uh, drink from their eyes with their strong proboscis. Um, and you see some of the other beautiful ones. The hieroglyphic moth is quite common, palmetto borer. Uh, and just look at some of the diversity here. The black witch moth, have you seen this? You guys still there? Yeah. Yeah. This is a very large moth. It hides in the daytime uh, under bridges, uh, in, uh, uh, in dark forests, and um, under the eaves of your house sometimes. And um, it's called a black witch because uh, native people thought that this was a, uh, an, a, an omen that somebody was going to die if you had one of these hanging around. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and you'll startle them when you're walking along and they startle you too. They fly out suddenly from where they're hiding and uh, they look like bats, they're so big. Uh, so the black witch is a, a really cool one. Um, and just all kinds of different ones. These underwing moths, another huge, uh, interesting group, very diverse. Um, and you'll notice they come in different colors of hind wings. There's a, a, a section that only have black hind wings. There's a section that has uh, orange or yellow hind wings. And then there's a section that has uh, red or pink wing, uh, hind wings. And you'll notice that four wings look like tree bark. They rest on tree trunks during the daytime. And uh, the theory is that they have these brightly colored hind wings. When a bird tries to attack them, the moth flies out. It shows this colorful pattern and it startles the bird who goes, whoa, what was that? And, and that happens with people too. I, I get startled with, by these uh, when they fly out. You go, what the heck was that that just flew by? And, um, and uh, so the other theory with these is uh, that these, uh, some are black, some are red, some are yellow uh, or pink uh, to um, add further confusion to the bird predators. You know, if they're all yellow, uh, maybe the birds would learn that and go, oh, well, I, I saw one of those yesterday. That's one of these mo big moths. I'm going to eat it. But then it comes up and, and tries to attack one and it's like, oh, what the heck, it's red or it's black, it's not red. Uh, and that adds a further confusing part uh, to the protection of these big moths. So that's a lovely group. You, you probably have some in your backyard, you may not even know it. Um, there's the looper group. They used to call these autographa, the genus autographa, because it looks like they've been autographed with silver markings. Uh, and just uh, all, all kinds of crazy shapes and how they rest with the wings. Um, uh, this one here, this uh, Sedosia moth, it, its caterpillar eats a plant in the strychnine family. And you're probably familiar, strychnine is a deadly poison. Uh, and just like monarchs, they're, they're using those poisons for their own defense. So they have very colorful patterns to warn predators that they're not edible. Pitcher plant moths, we have three different species of these in Florida, mostly in the panhandle. The adult moths live inside the pitcher plants and their caterpillars eat inside the pitcher plants. And they have special adaptations to avoid getting eaten by the plant. Uh, there, there's uh, certain moths that have uh, bird dropping appearances. Uh, so they resemble bird droppings. Um, the dagger moth group is very, very large and diverse. Um, here's another one of the, the bird dropping moths. Uh, the forester moths are day flying. We may see this at BB uh, Brown. I've seen them there before. Um, this is an interesting one, this diver moth. Um, it's uh, 
also called the bonnet worm. If you're a fisher person, uh, they, uh, these are, are caterpillars that bore down into spatter dock stems in lakes and rivers. Uh, and uh, fishermen will collect these sometimes and use them as fish bait because they're, they're pretty big. Uh, and uh, it, interestingly enough, uh, to uh, form their cocoons, the larvae, when they're mature, they have to swim. They are able to swim uh, across the water uh, to find land where they can make their cocoon. Um, and of course, ferns are a big group of plants in Florida, uh, but there aren't many moths that eat them. Uh, and this is one of the, one of the few, these uh, fern moths. There's a small group uh, that will attack ferns. Um, just to show you Spanish moth here, gorgeous moth. If you are growing amaryllis or uh, anything in that family in your yard, the, you may get attacked by the caterpillars. They're, they're gregarious, they feed in groups uh, and very colorful banded uh, caterpillar. Uh, and if you grow those up, you'll see this beautiful moth, the Spanish moth. Um, again, some other kinds of cutworms here. Uh, this gopher tortoise moth is interesting. It's in this group of idia moths. Uh, these feed on dead leaves, most of them. But the gopher tortoise one, it lives in the go gopher tortoise burrows, and it feeds on gopher tortoise droppings inside the burrows. There's another one of these that we have in Florida that's, um, it, 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 uh, the caterpillar lives in wood rat nests, and it eats the detritus inside wood rat nests. What the heck, you know, what kind of life is that? Um, lastly here, we have these beautiful little flower moths. Uh, they live, uh, the adults, you'll find them uh, starting about this time of year, perching on the flowers of their larval host plant. So the goldenrod moth, look on goldenrods and its caterpillar will eat goldenrods. This three-lined one eats um, uh, dog fennels. Uh, this fuller's one eats, um, Baldwina in, in dry places, uh, flowers. The, there's the prominent moth family, weird look caterpillars on these, and these are a lot of them are forest pests. They can strip whole forests of leaves. Uh, the pyralids are um, another really diverse group, hundreds of species. Um, and um, beautiful, they're small moths, but very interesting. Uh, and there's one carnivorous one here that eats scale insects as a caterpillar. This is a small moth. We may see this at BB Brown because the caterpillar attacks the cochineal bug that grows on cactuses, if you're familiar with that. Uh, there's a whole group of these with aquat that are aquatic. The, the, the larvae uh, on some of them, like these, have gills and live in, in lakes. Uh, and um, they... they uh, they can uh, obliterate plants like this. This one is Synclita obliteralis. It can just, uh, the ca caterpillars just attack and, and decimate uh, some kinds of aquatic plants. Here's the last one I'm going to go over, the, um, the cactus borer moth. Uh, and you may have heard this story of Cactoblastus cactorum. This is a moth from South America. Um, you know, they had brought cactuses to uh, Australia as ornamental plants. They escaped and just uh, went wild in Australia, taking over thousands of acres of nothing but cactuses with spines. Uh, and, uh, and so what, what did they do? They, they discovered that this moth attacks cactuses, op opuntias, the, um, the prickly pear types. They imported it into Australia and uh, this moth basically kick the ass of, 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 uh, of, uh, of those uh, cactuses. And uh, it didn't totally eradicate cactuses in Australia, but it really knocked them back. Has a very colorful banded larva. Well, recently, I think it was in the 1990s, somehow this moth got established in the Caribbean uh, and then it, it, it jumped into Florida and uh, it has been uh, spreading and attacking cactuses, which it, we never intended it to do that. It just accidentally got here and is uh, eating cactuses and destroying cactuses. 
all over the southeastern United States, and it's heading towards Mexico, where they're really afraid of, you know, what's it going to do once it gets into Mexico with all these, this huge diversity of cactuses. So um, uh, we may see this at BB Brown. I saw some last trip I was there attacking cactuses. Now, it turns out we have a native one that's already attacking cactuses, and that's this one, Melitaria prodinialis. And the, the adults almost look identical to the cactus, cactoblastus one, but the caterpillars are completely different. This is the blue cactus borer moth is the native one, and the banded one is the exotic one. So, um, so we'll look for those at BB Browns when we go there. Um, I've written all kinds of books about butterflies and butterfly gardening and guides uh, that you can find online. And um, as Mandy mentioned, I've been working in Cuba uh, and Cuba is a fascinating place. It's just a beautiful country. It's in turmoil now because of COVID and internal strife. And uh, so uh, I, I haven't gone for a couple of years now, but at some point Cuba is gonna open up again. I'm going to go there. Uh, we do, um, we take Jeeps, we hire Jeeps to go out and explore Cuba in places where tourists don't go. We're finding new species. We just published a new butterfly species for Cuba uh, last year. Uh, and there's other new things to discover there that it's just a beautiful place to, to, um, to, to explore. So if you're interested in going to Cuba, let me know. Wow. Uh, are you still awake? Yeah, we're all here. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Let me check the chat and see if we have any questions in here. Nothing yet. Anybody in the audience here have any questions for Mark? Yes. About the moth. How far south is that? The range. How far south does that go? What is the southernmost range of the Luna moth? Oh, the Luna moth. Um, it's throughout peninsular Florida and all over the eastern United States. It really loves sweet gum. So wherever there are sweet gum trees, you're likely to find a lot of Luna moths. It, it, it will be abundant in central Florida. Uh, and another question. Yeah, the cactus, uh, the exotic cactus moth, does that attack, attack the agave? Does it does not, okay. It does not attack agaves. It only attacks um, cactuses and mostly the prickly pear, the opuntia type of ca cactuses. Uh, but I think it does attack some of the other uh, groups as well. Um, so uh, keep an eye out. You'll see the cactuses, they're, they'll be brown uh, and dead looking uh, after they're done with it. So you'll know it's there. Worry about the tequila supply. <laughs> um, he, we are all worried about the tequila supply. So sounds like we're okay for now. <laughs> um, we have a question on Zoom. What is the latest on Shaws? Shaws. The Shaws swallowtail butterfly. This is an endangered uh, species of butterfly that only lives in the Upper Florida Keys, uh, and uh, we, University of Florida has been studying the shell swallowtail for, for several decades now. Uh, I worked on that as a graduate student there too. Uh, and we're just starting to understand it. It's, um, it goes through periods where it, it can be super abundant with hundreds of them flying around. Uh, and then it'll go years where it looks like it's died out and disappeared. But I think we're understanding that uh, it can over overwinter uh, several years as a chrysalis, uh, and it may not come out every year as an adult. And so I think, I think it's, it's in good shape. It's just we haven't understood the population dynamics of that. And what, what you know, in the lean years, it looked like it was almost extinct, but it was still probably out there as, as chrysalids. Uh, and and so, so far as we know, it's doing okay. Um, 
there is a citizen science part of that. If you're interested, um, they, they um, the um, some groups in South Florida go out and monitor the shell swallowtail on Key Largo. That that it's done right now. They it, the adults are only out until about June, but next year you could sign up if you care to go look for it with with people. Uh, just search for shell swallowtail uh, online, and you can volunteer to go and and. Uh, help monitor that that species. It's a beautiful butterfly. All right, very cool. Um, another question from Zoom. In the Plants for Birds effort of Doug Talamy, do you have any favorite trees for moths? Um, it's kind of like butterfly gardening in that uh, most species of moths are, you know, particular about what kinds of plants uh, they, they use. And every you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's interesting that we have over 3,000 kinds of plants in Florida, and there are over 3,000 different kinds of moths in Florida. Every kind of plant has at least one species of moth that eats, uh, eats it. And, um, and some like pines and oaks have dozens of species of moths that eat uh, the leaves, the seeds, the roots, uh, they bore into the stems. Uh, and so, um, it, it kind of depends on what you want to attract, I guess, uh, you know, as far as what, what uh, plants you want to choose for, for moths. Um, most moths also come to flowers uh, for nectar. And so the plants you're planting for butterflies for nectar, lantanas or uh, pentas or native, native wildflowers, uh, those would attract moths at night also. So if, if you're, you're doing good for moths, um, in fact, you need to go out with a flashlight probably and if you have a butterfly garden and look around at night and you, you'll see the moths coming in to feed starting at dusk. Um, the, the big hawk moths will start coming out. Many people mistake those for hummingbirds uh, coming out. You know, they'll, they'll tell me, oh, I see these brown hummingbirds coming to my garden at dusk. Well, those are the hawk moths uh, that are coming to feed. Uh, they've been waiting all day, uh, sleeping, and then waking up at dusk to come out and eat. And so take a look for those. And he was talking about the native lantana only. Don't think yes. lantana. We yes. do have native lantanas, yes. We have a question from the audience here. Do you have any moths that specialize in pollinating night-blooming cactus? Any moths for night blooming cactus? For uh, night blooming cactus pollination. I, I don't know of any uh, specific moths that do that. And I believe the night blooming cactuses are the tree cactuses in the Keys and uh, coastal areas. Uh, and I, I thought those were also pollinated by bats. Um, but uh, moths may come to those as well. If there's nectar, if there's nectar in those flowers, the moths will be there. Um, do you know of any moth that feeds on silk grass or Pityopsis graminifolia? Yeah, um, flower group. Um, wait, I miss it here. Um, in the fl the flower moths. <clears throat> These guys, these little flower moths. Um, there's one that uh, that lives on Pityopsis, and the caterpillars eat Pityopsis. So when Pityopsis is flowering, look at the flowers and see if you'll see the. Uh, it'll be a yellow one that matches the flower color. <clears throat> In fact, this one, this crimson one, I, I don't know if you can guess what flower that one uses, but it's um, it's Gaura, which has a pink flower. Uh, these moths usually match the colors of the host plants, the flowers of the host plants that they sit on. Very cool. We have another question on Zoom. Other than birds, what other predators do moths have to be weary of? Lawnmowers? Um, all of them. I mean, lizards, uh, spiders, they're attacked by parasitic wasps and flies. Um, ants, uh, all, all of that kind of stuff. 
there's so many predators out there. It's a wonder we have any butterflies and moths left, really. In fact, I like to tell folks, you know, out of, uh, say, say, a swallowtail butterfly that may lay 100 eggs, out of that 100 eggs, only one or two will ever make it to be an adult butterfly again because of, there's so many predators out there. But that's part of their role in nature also is, is you know, there's their food for other critters. And so, um, uh, so that, that's, a, that's a cool thing. Um, I might mention Andy Warren at the Florida Museum here noticed this uh, odd phenomenon um, on his porch. One day he was sweeping his porch and these oakworm moths, he had a spider. It was a spider, uh, one of the orb spiders, uh, Argiope, uh, the golden garden spider or silver garden spider, had made a web on his porch. And as he, he was sweeping his porch, one of these oakworm moths flew in and, and got caught into the net uh, of the spider, the spider web. Uh, and he thought, well, that, that was really strange. You know, these are normally thought of as night flying, but this was a day flying one. And then another one came in, and then another one. And he tested this. He found in the literature a really old, old observation that uh, those Argiope spiders uh, have a scent that matches the pheromones of this moth, of this group of moths. And so he went out to Colorado. He brought his spider with him out to Colorado and put it out in a natural area. And sure enough, it attracted a, a, a related species of oakworm moth out in Colorado to the web. And so um, that was pretty phenomenal. That's so cool. Any other questions? We have time for one more. Eugene? Any moths that eat Caesar weed? <laughs> yeah. There, there's uh, there's uh, a really common pest moth. Uh, Caesar weed is in the, the hibiscus family, the Malvaceae. And uh, this moth also attacks um, okra in your garden and, and many kinds of hibiscus family plants. But I, I noticed recently in South Florida that um, that, that moth was really just dis destroying uh, stands of Caesar weed down there. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so there's there's things that eat it. All right, we need to bring that up here to Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was that? Oh, is IFAS working on that or studying that? Um, IFAS only studies stuff that's a pest of, you know, they would study it as a pest of uh, okra to probably get rid of it ra rather than encourage it. Mm -hmm. Sounds right. Thank you so much, Mark. That was an awesome presentation. And it's, it's, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and we hope that some of you can make it to BB Brown's nursery as a follow up uh, on August 14th is when the field trip is going to be. And that's in Claremont. It should be posted on our tar paper as well as over social media. So Mark, it looks like we lost you this last second here, but thank you so much. Uh, we're going to maybe take a five minute break and then we're going to do our plant drawing for those here in person. And thank you everyone for joining us on Zoom. Oh, I'll put up the slide with the camping, uh, with the camping information. All right, thank you everybody. And Julie has tickets for sale for our wonderful plant drawing tonight. Very cool. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that part. Jackie's gonna do our plant descriptions. <laughs>
And everybody on Zoom, if you want to email uh, tarflower at fmps.org, I will send you back our registration form for the camping trip. It is limited. Uh, space is limited. We can only have 25 people total at the group camping site, but it's going to be really fun. And if you can't come camping, everyone is still welcome to join us on that field trip on uh, October 9th morning with Dr. Hugel. Um, but not to be uh, overtaken by our August 14th field trip to BB Brown. So thank you. Yes. If you're not familiar with them, just go ahead and take a picture of the uh, description for future reference. But one of this is coral honeysuckle or Missura. Um, great, it is for a vine, it's not too bad to behave. It sort of stays put, doesn't try to kill the tree it's growing in. Uh, it does real well on fences, and it is a fabulous hummingbird.